Denver Rescue Mission says it no longer bans gay and trans employees. Will that be enough to hold on to a multi-million dollar city contract? A group of grandmas is the official welcome party for refugees here from Guatemala. Absolutely. They're part of my family. A small county may have misplaced millions of dollars meant for a reservoir. Oh, damn indeed. And if you need another reason to get hot about Excel bills, we learn that you are also paying for their lawyers. Marshall Zellinger, turning up the heat again, tonight on Next. The Denver Rescue Mission is poised to get millions more in taxpayer dollars just a few months after that nonprofit was caught discriminating against LGBTQ employees. That was a direct violation of the Rescue Mission's contract with the city of Denver. Now City Council will consider a $9 million contract extension for the Denver Rescue Mission later this month. Looked like the contract could be pulled or at least not extended after it came out that the Rescue Mission's employee handbook banned gay and trans employees. It appears the Denver Rescue Mission has had a come-to-Jesus moment on the issue of discrimination. They told us today they want to be more inclusive in their hiring, and they've dropped that ban on gay and trans employees. Denver's Department of Housing Stability says the city is now reviewing the employment policies of all the homeless service providers. Councilwoman Robin Kanich, who is a big critic of the discriminatory policies, says she thinks that the rescue mission is now in compliance. And Kanich told us she believes in reconciliation. There is a way to give a literal hand to the newcomers arriving in Colorado as refugees. Chance to meet them at the airport, help carry their luggage, guide them on their first steps into their new lives in Colorado. Our Katie Eastman explores how sponsorship works. She met with a group that went from volunteers to basically family in less than a year. So there's Alien. Grandmothers, Alien. love, showing off photos. And this is when I took uh, Michael and Elian to the Rapids game. But these aren't their grandkids. They are pictures of the family they met nine months ago. A family from Guatemala that has become their own. We love them. We want them to be happy and we want them to succeed. At ACC, we have a program called co-sponsorship, which is where we invite groups of seven or more volunteers uh, to raise some funds, to gather some in-kind donations, to nest a home for a refugee family, and then to partner with a refugee family for their first nine months in the United States. This co-sponsorship group paired with Elian and Yorlin's family. They received refugee status because of persecution in Guatemala. Y nos vimos amenazado. This group helped them navigate a new life. Teaching them the bus routes was a major adventure um, for all of us. Getting their internet installed. Y lo que quiero con toda mi familia es Aprender. Offering help wasn't always easy. And that there's been a lot of uh, humorous uh, occasions when you're trying to communicate and you're totally uh, not communicating, and then you just start laughing. <laughs> Laughter only brought them closer. And really quickly that we got to the point where we wanted the families to succeed because we liked them. <laughs> Nosotros los consideramos como familia porque nos han brindado mucho apoyo. Most people have two grandmothers, this family has seven more. Absolutely. They, they're part of my family. For Next, I'm Katie Eastman. The official co-sponsorship with the resettlement agency has ended, but this sponsor group told us they are now connected for the long run. They've already got plans for dinner and a trip to the zoo, trip to an urban farm. We have information on applying to sponsor new families in this article on 9news.com. House Republicans passed a bill today to open up oil and gas drilling on some protected public land in Colorado. Now, it's almost certain that this bill, which was pushed by Republican Congressman Lauren Boebert, is not going to pass the Democratic Senate. The Republican bill would bring new oil and gas drilling to the Thompson Divide. It's a wild expanse in western Colorado. Think like south of Glenwood Springs and west of Crested Butte. The Biden administration unilaterally paused new oil and gas development on the Thompson Divide after a Republican filibuster threat blocked a bill that would have protected that land through law. The president said he's considering a 20-year withdrawal of new energy leases from that area. The Republican bill at Boebert's direction would tell the Biden administration to increase oil and gas development on federal lands across the country. Again, bill's not likely going anywhere with Democrats in charge of the Senate. The total county budget in sparsely populated Rio Blanco County was less than $27 million last year. I bring that fact up for some context on another fact. The county may have lost track of up to $4 million. Not great. County leaders think that the money was taken in some kind of wire transfer scam. It was a $4 million grant supposed to go to the Wolf Creek Reservoir Project, but the dollars, or at least all of them, 
did not arrive. That is big money in a small county. We're told the bank involved and the FBI are now investigating. So we've talked about how Excel and other energy companies pass along natural gas costs dollar for dollar. What they pay for the gas is what we pay for the gas. What we just learned is that Excel is also allowed to pass along the cost of its legal team. We are paying for Excel's lawyers who try to get the regulators to charge us more for a whole variety of things. Here's Marshall Zellinger. I'm not uh, able to answer a question. When the Public Utilities Commission can only listen and not respond, who do you reach out to for answers about high utility bills? We are independent of both the Public Utilities Commission and the governor's office. Cindy Schoenhout is the director of the UCA, the State Office of Utility Consumer Advocate, basically our lifeline, defending us consumers in front of the PUC when energy companies like Excel ask for rate increases. We haven't been very successful. And the reason is because we're an advocate, not a decision maker. The three PUC commissioners are the decision maker. Take, for example, the most recent $64 million gas rate increase that the PUC approved to take effect this past November. The UCA fought against some of the costs, including $2.2 million that Excel wanted built into the rate increase to pay for the legal team that was needed to argue for the rate increase. The cost that the company incurred to put on a case to raise consumer rates consumers are paying for those costs. As part of the rate increase, we're yeah. refunding their legal fees to get the rate increase. We are giving them the money to get the rate increase, yes. If it's any consolation, the PUC knocked the $2.2 million down to $2 million, and the PUC encouraged Excel to better manage its expenses related to rate cases. As far as a success from our office, I would really point to yesterday's public comment hearing. And the reason is we didn't speak, of course. Consumers did, and they had something to say. And if you have something to say, the UCA wants to hear from you. You can call or email, but their email is ridiculously long. So go to the website, uca.colorado.gov. Scroll all the way down to the bottom left. In the last two months, the UCA received 102 emails and voicemails, with another dozen since the PUC public meeting yesterday. I will tell you, I've been in this position nine years. I can't even measure the order of magnitude difference between what we received in the last six to 12 months from consumers with the whole nine years before that. I would argue that the scariest place in your house is no longer the unfinished basement, but perhaps right there on the side of the house. Holy moly, is that email address unconscionable. So if you go to the website, uca.colorado.gov, you can scroll to the bottom and click on the email link and it auto populates so that you don't have to write it in. Also, I noticed at the top of the website, there is a Google form. Now, if you click a link, you can just type in some information about what you want to complain about, Kyle. Uh, it, listen, if I was a cynical person, Marshall, which I'm not, uh, I, I believe everybody and everything, I would think they don't actually want people sending emails to that address based on its length and complexity. You got, I mean, you know, I'm Marshall at 9news.com because I don't think people can spell my first and last name very easily. <laughs> so it's just simply Marshall at 9news.com. Perhaps we could come up with UCA at state.co.us if it has to end like that. Yeah. Well, as Marshall said, Go to his article. It'll auto-populate the form for you. You're making it easy. Thank you, Marshall. If there was a simple solution to the issue of homelessness, we would not be talking about it near every night here. We know that the causes and the contributing factors vary. We also know that there are different paths out of homelessness for different people. So let's talk about one path, and let's do something about it. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign supports the Karis community. The Karis community is a nonprofit that provides transitional housing for Coloradans with serious and persistent mental illness. Our neighbors who do not need hospitalization for their mental health, but they aren't quite ready to live on their own. They stay at Karis' two houses in Denver, where Karis' staff and their peers surround them with support and acceptance and guidance and structure. It's a place where Coloradans build the bonds and confidence and routines that will help them lead independent, healthy lives. The leaders at Karis Community tell me that about 40% of the people staying with them come directly from living on the streets. 80% of the people they work with have experienced homelessness somewhere in their life's journey. Karis is designed to be one path out of the tough situations that are so often rooted in serious mental health challenges. 
scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. I'll send you that link to donate. Your $10 million in counting and microgiving proves that even $5 donations do add up fast. So I'll match the first 50 donations of $5 to get us rolling. Karis is a place where people heal, where people put the streets behind them and move forward to living independently. Colorado Republicans have a big vote coming up, and they're arguing over whether fellow Republicans can be trusted to run a fair election. Denver unveils its vision for getting around the city. It's a future with far fewer cars and a lot of money, money the city currently doesn't have. That's next. When it comes to conserving water in the Colorado River Basin, there is California's plan and there's everybody else's plan. California's Water Board submitted its proposal to the feds. They are standing alone against Colorado and five other states which have a different idea of how to do it. California is the river's largest water user, and they're telling federal regulators they will make 1.6 million acre feet in cuts, 1.6 mil. The feds have called for all of the states together to provide 1.4 million acre feet in cuts. So similar to the six state proposal that includes Colorado, California is suggesting that these drastic cuts happen only if the main reservoirs, Mean, uh, Mead and Powell, fall below certain levels. But California is pointing out that under the law, they do have the oldest water rights. They have priorities, so they want Arizona and Nevada to make more cuts. Colorado's Republicans have raised unfounded allegations of rigged elections, and now they are arguing amongst themselves over whether they can be trusted to run fair elections. So they're preparing to pick a new state Republican chair. State Republican leaders just voted to have a group of neutral outsiders come in to supervise the El Paso County GOP's upcoming leadership elections. There's a fight down there between conservatives and farther right Republicans over the leadership of the El Paso County Party. Incumbent Chair Vicki Tonkins is running for another term. Her opponents are publicly questioning whether she will run a fair election for her seat. The state party previously censured Tonkin, saying that she had failed to support some Republican candidates and that that's her job. She's suing the state Republican Party. Warmer weather finally making its way into Colorado. If you were outside this afternoon, it was actually very nice. We made it to 41 degrees at DIA. Most of the front range in eastern plains was in the middle 30s to lower 40s. We saw some upper 40s to the south here in Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Single digits to 40s in the high country. 36 was the high out west in Grand Junction. Now temperatures are cooling down, of course, after the sun is set. 27 degrees. It feels like 17 with winds coming in from the south at around 11 miles per hour. So this is the first night in a while where the wind chill hasn't been too entirely bad. But let's take a look at this 24 hour temperature change map. Just this time yesterday, we were almost 20 degrees colder in Denver, and you can really see that change across the eastern half of the state where that warmer air is really starting to fill in after that Arctic air mass really just settled over the eastern half of Colorado. Now, as you take a look at our HD Doppler radar, we do have these deadly ice storms pushing their way through Texas, even through other states like uh, Arkansas making its way into Tennessee there. But right here in Colorado, we're going to see some nice dry weather over the next couple of days. So all we're going to see coming from the sky is just going to be some in and out cloud cover. Not tonight, though. We stay mostly clear with an overnight low near 16 degrees. And the next couple of days gets warmer and warmer. We'll see seasonal temperatures tomorrow in the middle 40s. And then we spend the weekend in the low 50s. Lots of sunshine there before we get some slight snow chances returning next Monday. Imagine a city that spends twice as much on safe streets than it does on police. A blueprint for Denver's future imagines that possibility next. Denver's Department of Transportation has some big plans that would require big funding that does not currently exist. The city has spent two years drafting its newly released Denver Moves Everyone plan. It is a literal roadmap of short and long-term projects intended to improve infrastructure in the city, make it safer, more efficient, more environmentally friendly. This plan paints a picture of a city that will become less dependent on cars. The city says by 2030 it wants to provide hundreds of miles of new bikeways and sidewalks and bus corridors. In the long term, the plan focuses on maintaining existing public transit, things like expanding transit centers and adding some bus routes to underserved areas. The plan envisions a quote-unquote world-class transportation system, and, and planners acknowledge that will not be cheap. To meet their long-term public transit goals, they estimate they would need 700 to 800 million dollars a year. I, for one, had no idea how much that actually was in a city budget, so we looked it up. 
They want seven to eight hundred million dollars a year for infrastructure. The Denver police budget this year is a bit more than three hundred million. The department says their average funding for transportation is closer to one hundred and seventy million right now. So about half what we spend on police. And that's not even enough to maintain what we have. So they admit that they're behind on current projects. They estimate that 93% of Denver's multi-use trails are not up to the city standards. 65% of traffic stops and 40% of sidewalks are not up to standard. They estimate that their maintenance responsibilities alone require more than $100 million a year. Our next question is about those taxpayer bill of rights refunds most Coloradans received last summer. Jack told us his state refund is higher than usual and wants to know if he needs to enter that Tabor refund as income when he files his state taxes. Jack, short direct answer, no, you will not be taxed on your Tabor refund because you've already been taxed on that money. This is your money that is being refunded to you, so the refund is not taxable. You do not claim it anywhere on your taxes. Treat it like your regular state and federal refunds that you get each year. We'll have your feedback next. Isolation is a serious challenge for Coloradans who are living with persistent and serious mental health issues. A nonprofit called Caris Community sees breaking that isolation as a key way to help people move from lives that have been marked by hospitalizations and perhaps even homelessness into eventually living independently and happily. Caris Community provides transitional living for Coloradans who don't need inpatient mental health care but aren't quite ready to live on their own. They have two houses in Denver where they defeat isolation. It's a place where hope thrives. You can scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get that link to join me in donating. We talk a lot about possible solutions to homelessness. For some in our community, that is one path out. The most Colorado thing we've seen today is something that, honestly, we have seen before, but we can't get enough of it because it just amuses us every time. It's the dog and goggles thing, particularly this dog's look, which is very like 1980s in Aspen. And the understated confidence of the dog also really lends something to this. If you see something in traffic or elsewhere that says Colorado to you and you can safely take a picture, be like Robin Louisville and send it our way. Next at 9news.com is the email, or you can use the hashtag HeyNext. Feedback tonight, Mitch writes in to say, I so appreciate how mindful you are when speaking of our fellow humans who are experiencing homelessness, mental health challenges, and substance use. Mitch says you make this accessible, yet human, not judgmental. Mitch, I don't, I don't have a lot of expertise on these things, but you look around and you see a lot of judgment. So it seems like if, if judgment could solve homelessness or mental health challenges or substance use, then judgment would have solved those things by now. So maybe a different approach is in order. And a text. Why is XL Energy advertising when they have a captive market? That's a very fair question and one that we've asked some questions of our own about. And Marshall Zellinger will be telling us more about that in the coming days and weeks. Keep the feedback coming. We'll see you next time.